as we open Judges 12. And we begin with Judges 12, verse 6 today. Let us be mindful of the symbols that we are looking for. Let us be mindful and watchful of symbols that we may see. Let us rely upon our Heavenly Father for his guidance in this study. And as we seek his will, so that his will is done in our lives and in all that we would have to say. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, <clears throat> as we come before you today, we thank you for these many opportunities we've been having to study together. We ask, Father, for your guidance, for your direction, and for your blessing. May your spirit be with us. May your spirit guide us. May your spirit open our minds to all of that which we are studying and which we will read today. Help us now. We accept the promise that you have given us, that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. May your angels attend us. We ask this, Father, not for ourselves, but for those that will listen, for those that will study, for those that will come with a spirit and an attitude of wanting to understand that which is written within your word. Direct us in these paths, help us so that it is your character that others may see. In all that is done and in all that is said, be with us now, we ask and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, yesterday we were, at the end of the session, we were working through this on Judges 12, 6. Then they said unto him, say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of the Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites, 40 and 2,000. Now, as you pointed out, yesterday theodore this is quite a slaughter mm -hmm, Forty-two thousand, yeah ephraimites now at the time that the tribe of ephraim came into the promised land how many people were there and just in that one tribe uh there was uh was it forty thousand five hundred um let me just see here yeah, 40,500 of the Ephraimites in, um, when they crossed the Jordan River, and they counted them at that time. Okay. Were there any other countings that were done between, this, between that point and this? Um, well, actually, I, um, so I think I'm, I'm saying this wrong. So I'm just looking at my chart here trying to figure this out. Um, yeah, so there was actually 40,500 when they crossed the, um, when they counted them um, in Numbers chapter chapter 2. In Numbers 26, actually Ephraim had even gone down to 32,500. So they were 8,000 less at that time. So now they're going to have 42,000 that are going to be killed. Now, of course, this is 300 some years after they crossed the Jordan. Right. So, yeah, I was looking at the chart wrong. Um, so, so yeah, they had 32,500 when they crossed the Jordan. So they're down 8,000 from when they had crossed the Red Sea. Um, so obviously it built up their numbers in this period of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, having 42,000 of your tribe slain, of your men, it's definitely going to affect your tribe. 
yeah, we're not <clears throat> we're not quite dealing with a situation like we've seen several weeks ago in the latter chapters here of Judges, but to lose 42,000 men mm -hmm. of one tribe is very significant. Yeah. Now, is there a symbol that we can draw from the 42,000? Well, I mean, we have the number 42 there. Okay, six by seven, what else? Um, well, because we don't, we don't have a 42 on either of the 1843 or the 1850 charts. We do have the 42 months, three and a half, 1260. Yeah. yeah. So, so 1260 is 42 months. And this is verse 12, one, two, six, or 12, six. Right. So. Um, so you have two symbols of uh, the 12, uh, 1260 years. Which also would then be two symbols of the 2520. Yeah. And then you also have the fact that the shin in Shibboleth is uh, three, uh, 360 if you spell it out as a word. Um, so shin, um, yod, and noon, right? So that's 360. That's 300 plus 10 plus 50. Noon being 50, yod being 10, shin being 300. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we were as we were addressing this yesterday, Shibboleth signifieth a stream or a flood. We started to read other verses that were supplied by the translators, that were noted by the translators. We started with Psalm 69, verse 2. I sink in deep mire where they're standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. And then 69, 15, <coughs> let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. The third verse, Isaiah 27, 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and he shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. Combining these three verses together, what symbols can we address? I mean, here we're looking at an overflowing stream. Right. So the Sunday law symbolism. Okay. Are we not also given symbolism of other overflowing issues in the book of Daniel? Mm -hmm. Which, of course, do relate to the Sunday law as symbols. Okay. But I mean, where, else, where else do we have overflow and Passover? Um, well, we have that in Isaiah chapter 8. Um, we have it in Daniel 11, uh, what is it, 10? Or is it 11? Yeah, overthrow and pass through in, in verse 10, Daniel eleven ten, And then we have um, uh, overflow and pass over in Daniel 11, verse 40. Now, of course, we know that refers to um, 1989. But the thing that we have learned about our line is that we're actually, our whole line is really the Sunday law line. This repeat of history, the repeat of the first and second angel's messages, with the second angel arriving at 9-11, joining the third angel that had already um, 
begun on October 22nd, 1844, is, is not part of the big line. It is, it is just the Sunday law waymark. So we can see how, what, why the Sunday law symbolism is used there in Daniel 11, verse 40. And it should have been a key to us that this is the beginning of the Sunday law. But it's, okay. it's a reform line of the Sunday law. That's what we are in. So did you have some other thoughts on, on that? Well, <clears throat> overflow and Passover is something that we deal with as far as, as far as this with the Sunday law, yes. But mm -hmm. in overflowing, would we also not have that available in Deuteronomy 33, 23? Regarding Naphtali. Okay, so um, that's going to be a Naphtali, he said. Oh, Naphtali satisfied with favor and full with blessing of the Lord. Possess thou west and south. Um, so there you're going to have this word. Uh, let me see here. Um, Okay, specifically, what are you looking at there with Naphtali? Well, the favor that was granted to them. Yeah. But so like you... Full, full with the blessing. Yeah. Now, in Isaiah 28, you have three times that overflowing is being presented. Isaiah 28, 2, 28, 15, and 28, 18. Yeah. Which is the overflowing scourge that shall pass through. This is the right. Sunday law again. Okay. What would we see then in either Isaiah 30, 28 or Ezekiel 13, 11? Because 30, 28 as his breath, as an overflowing stream, shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of vanity, and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. Yeah, so this is, in Ezekiel, it's talking about a building that's going to be destroyed. I mean, we had studied that in detail, uh, that this was basically the false methods of study that were being used um, by the Protestants and also by Parminder. Right. Aren't going to be able to stand in the Sunday law. So they, they use untempered mortar to put together this wall. Right, and we talked about this wall. Um, I mean, one is in the context of FFA. Um, so I, I don't want to go into that study of Ezekiel 13 there, but we, we definitely could see it as the false methods of study that weaken this wall. So in this situation, to avoid this overflowing, this, this false method of study, we need to be very careful about our method of study. Yeah. We need to continue with the line upon line, but very much in the form and format that we would see from, from Miller's rules, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So... And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the streams of Egypt. And ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. So they're looking, they're going from the channel of the river 
unto the stream of Egypt. Is this symbolically not going from something that is fairly powerful to something that is fairly simple? How would we see this? The channel of the river to the stream of Egypt. I don't know. Uh, because the promise that you will be gathered one by one, O children of Israel, would that not be referring to those that accept the true message, the correct message, the message that we would find according to Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> this would have been difficult for someone like Jephthah, knowing that he was going to have to slay 42,000, or seeing that he had slain 42,000 of his brothers of Ephraim. As a symbol right now, how would we see this within the movement? Well, um, I mean, nobody likes to be in conflict with their brethren. Right. At least we shouldn't like to be. Um, so it's difficult, but I mean, this is, is a message. I mean, the message of the Ephraimites, um, that is their message is, is one of gossip, misrepresentation, character assassination. Okay. <clears throat> um, Right, so they, they falsely accuse uh, Jephthah of, of not calling them when he did. Um, but then there's going to be this division that occurs, right, over the shibboleth, which we connect to righteousness by faith and its prophetic place. Right. I mean... I mean, really, what we're studying right now on Friday evenings and sometimes Sabbath afternoons is how all three angels' messages are righteousness by faith. And that if you have the third angel's message by itself, without the prophetic foundation, it has no power. That is, in order to know Christ, who he is, we know him through, through the types through the symbols, through prophecy, and, and how we approach and accept and understand and participate in prophecy. So to say I know Christ or to try to get to know Christ, you know, by imagining the cross or imagining different things, without the prophetic foundation, you're, not, you're just going to have something of your own imaginings to worship. You're not going to know the true Christ. And so righteousness by faith is tied to this prophetic message. So here we have the symbol of the 1260, number 42, and we have the 126. In this context of this shibboleth, which has this letter that is, um, the symbol there is uh, of, of, the, of the, the letter Shin that starts the word Shibboleth as being the number 360, which is a symbol of um, the day for a year, right? 360. So um, I mean, it, it definitely fits with what we have now. Okay. It's also interesting when we look at this because 
the message of righteousness by faith was presented in 1888. It was not understood by the leadership. It was not accepted by the leadership and has not truly been accepted to this very day. Mm -hmm. Yet, the message removing the prophetic understandings was presented in 1919 and has largely been accepted throughout the church since that time. So we have the true message presented in 1888, but not understood. We have the false message presented in 1919, and the false message has largely been accepted. Yeah. Now, the thing about 1919, I mean, if you, you read um, uh, the, the doctrine of Christ, I mean, there isn't a lot that's objectionable there. I mean, I don't know if you can find anything that's, that you could say is error. It's more just the absence of things that is the problem. It's what's missing. <clears throat> well, what does Mrs. White say is the central pillar of Adventism? Well, it's the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. So it's not just the sanctuary. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. But in 1919, what is the one message that W.W. W. Prescott hoped to never again have to give? Well, the 2300 days. The message of the sanctuary investigative judgment, etc. All right. By 1957, leaders within the church had agreed that there was an issue, they'd agreed with themselves that there was an issue with the sanctuary message and the investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. By 1980, this was being presented to the church at large. Mm -hmm. And you have those like Cottrell <clears throat> that we're very adamant that this cannot be supported in any manner by their, quote, advanced methods of study, unquote. Yeah. And of course, he's correct. It can't be supported by their advanced methods of study. But their advanced methods of study set aside everything that made this church separate from the rest of the world. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, it, it, if they had thought logically, then they would have said, I mean, they would have just rejected Adventism if, if they really believed their advanced methods of study were correct. And that's the thing that's always surprised me is that people um, use a system of study that show that Millerite history is just a bunch of nonsense in their minds, and yet they still want to be Seventh-day Adventists. And it, it always puzzles me why people don't just leave the church if they're really so unhappy with Adventism. But... The methods that Miller used, they led us to a certain truth. And then people want to reject that. And the same is with July 18th. It led us to a certain place. You can't now go back and uh, dismantle all of the things that led us to that conclusion, dismiss them, and still hold on to July 18th. But yet people will do that. They will hold on to it as a, a symbol or a waymark or some, 
something, but yet they reject the things that, that brought us to July 18th because they want to be focused upon medical missionary work and the third angel's message. Nothing wrong with the medical missionary work, but if what you're using is a counterfeit, a new age counterfeit of the medical missionary work that's not found in the spirit of prophecy, and if you're, you only have the third angel's messages and not the first two, you're doing the same thing that the church has done with Millerite history. Basically, by abandoning Millerite history, by setting it aside, everything that led to the foundation is being set aside as well. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't set aside the foundations and have a stable building. You cannot place a building, a foundation that is not stable. So there's a lot that goes right back into this <clears throat> that we have to consider because the message that had been given in 1888 has largely been ignored. We're working right now, both here and in your Friday night studies to uncover the true message and not the false. Mm -hmm. Because we have to be prepared to give that true message. And, and they, they're very similar, Shibboleth and Sibboleth. Uh, the difference between these two words, because uh, Sibboleth they spell with a Samic and Shibboleth with a Shin, um, and they just spell it that way so that you can clearly see that it's uh, how it's to be pronounced. Um, uh, the difference is 300 because the Samic is 60 and, well, it's not 300. It's going to be oh, 280. I guess the difference between the two is 280. But you have one that's 360, the Shin, uh, if it's spelt out as a word. It's 300 if you, so I guess I'd have to look at what, at Samic itself. Um, but anyway, there's a difference between it, that, and they're, they're close symbols, right, to each other, 360 and 60. Right. But it's missing something, right? It's missing 300, which is the story of Gideon. And, and what is the story of Gideon as a symbol? If we are to really uh, distill it down to its basic message, <clears throat> wouldn't it be righteousness by faith? Right. It I mean, would have to be. Yeah, he's mentioned in the faith chapter, and he and he shows this. This illustrates righteousness by faith really well. Would Ephraim uh, represent Parmenter and Tess? E Ephraim? Yeah, the group. Well, well, it it reject it, it. They would be included in that, but it wouldn't be exclusive to Parmenter and Tess. I mean, we would also see it in December uh, sixth declaration, because basically. Those that rejected July 18th rejected it on the same basis that Parminder and Tess rejected it. That is, they used the same arguments that Parminder and Tess used against 
tests used against July 18, 2020. Um, but you were saying this is in the group. But, the so, 2520. Yeah. Right. So they would be included in that, right? Because the Ephraim and Manasseh are the sons of Joseph, right? And Joseph, we've shown since 2016, that Joseph represents this movement. So, so they would be included in that. But they're going to be using the wrong methods of study. And they're, they're not going to understand righteousness by faith. They're going to have a message that is close to the true message, but it's off by one little bit. Really, it's just the moving of a dot in, in a word, shibboleth, to move it to from the right side of the letter to the left side, and you get sibboleth. And so that's the difference. It's not, big, it's not a big difference in, in you know, orthography, but it is a big difference when it comes to which side you're on. You know, Jesus says, you know, if you, for one dotting of the I or the crossing of the T, one yod or tittle, um, is removed. You can't, you can't remove one, one of those things from the law. And yet that's what's done. I mean, there's so many things that are similar to those that are teaching uh, the truth to those that are, are rejecting the truth. But yeah, I mean, it definitely would include Parmender and Tess as the Ephraimites, because they're part of this movement, or were. I would still you know, hold to the point that this, the Ephraimites were those post Parmender and Tess that expressed initially their acceptance of the July 18th message and then chose to reject it after July 18th. Okay, I, I don't see how that can be. No. Um, so so when, we, when we look at this story, so what we had figured out is that um, Jephthah is a Gileadite. He's of the tribe of Manasseh. And he's going to be rejected. So that July 18th is rejected by the movement, right? Okay. And that part of the movement, um, the way that I look at it, is that part of the movement is the part that we would call FFA after, because uh, that's going to be in connection with the time when Parminder's group leaves. So, so I... I Ephraim has to represent part of the movement, but not just Parminder's part or not just the part after Parminder leaves. It has to include Parminder, but not all of Parminder. But the, the one that rejects July 18th and then invites July 18th back is not Ephraim, right? That is going to be Manasseh, the Gileadites. They invite the message of July 18th, Jephthah, back into the movement after they have cast him out. He will open, yes. Right. So, so they take him back. But we know that Ephraim had been called, and that would include people in the movement that still existed after Parminder's groups left. So Ephraim would represent those in the movement would include Parminder, but also include those that are still in the movement. You right? think they're going to come back one by one, like the bottom of the verse says? Um, uh, so where, where, what, are, which verse are you referring to? What's on the screen? Isaiah twenty-seven twelve. Oh, oh, Isaiah twenty-seven twelve. Um, I don't think that that would apply 
here to this. I mean, we have a verse that's dealing with, because uh, you have to look at Isaiah 27, 12 in the whole context there. So I don't know if we would just apply it just because we have the word shibboleth there um, to apply it, because there's a different context with Isaiah 27 and 28. Um, so what I would think is that, um, of course, this is just my opinion. This is the way that I, what I way that I see this. But if we're going to take the Ephraimites and the Manassites, the children of Manasseh, as representative of this movement, that's the children of Joseph. Um, when we look at the story of Jephthah, this is about what happens in connection with. Um, the message of July 18th, being rejected by FFA and then being taken back. So Manasseh must represent FFA after Parminder has left or around that time that he leaves. The Ephraimites, they've been called, and, and those are going to include Parminder and Tess, but they're also going to conclude the people that are still in the movement because there are people in the movement that actually – are in sympathy with the arguments that Parminder and Tess used against July 18th. They're still in sympathy with what was being taught before, even though they still are in the movement and haven't joined Parminder and Tess in their apostasy. They're still, they still have the same thinking. Right, and we saw that with the December 6th, uh, 2020 declaration, here we had a group that was definitely not Parminder and Tess's group, but they were still the same. And those they still exist within the movement. They still have the same sentiments. They still have the same prejudice against the symbolic use of numbers. They might profess to believe in July 18, but really they did not come to the defense of the message of July 18. And they're just waiting for July 18 to go away so that they can have their agenda pressed within the movement. And they've been pressing that, that message, and, it, and it's simple, it's the message, the false message of the medical missionary work and the false message of righteousness by faith, which they call the third angel's message. And those two things are or the same problem that, that conservative Adventism has had for a long time. And, and really that the church has had too. The, the church is more extreme because their medical missionary work is their hospitals. But, but it doesn't matter. Both of these are counterfeits of the true. They're not the real thing. Dwight, what do you think? I'm not disagreeing. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, so, we've, we've yeah. had so much of this over the last, you know, 140, 160 years that has not been according to that which God would have done. So if it's not according to his way, it's according to man's way. If it's according to man's way, it stands in opposition to God. You know, God's God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. By far. You know, the problem with us, with humanity, is we think because we came up with an idea, it must be correct. Because we thought of it, we're going to push ahead with that idea. Not considering how little we know and understand. We know so little. Without God's direction, without the Holy Spirit that inspired the scriptures, there's no way that we can understand it. Now, God has given us a method of study, but that method isn't just intellectual. You can't just approach the scriptures with your mind. You have to be submitted to God. Be obedient to the light that he has given you. 
and then he can open up to things to you that you could never have seen, no matter how much intellect you had. But yet man always puts his intellect above the word of God. We saw this with Parminder. We see it with the church. We saw it with Desmond Ford, with the church back in 1957 and also in 1919. We can get the idea that we sort of understand and that people should listen to us. But what we have to do is teach people to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to point them to the scriptures and, and we have to trust that God can instruct others and that, you know, we in a sense are indispensable because the Holy Spirit can do all of this without any of us. That's a thought that man does not like. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what I believe is as we've studied here, we've, we've been, the book of Judges has opened up to us. It's, it's always been one of those books that I, I could never get through. I mean, because I just had, you know, no context in which to understand it, nothing in which to, um, it's just kind of almost like the dark ages or something. It's just this area that's dark. And, it's, and especially because chronologically, it's, it's hard to sort out. But, you know, once we had the key to seeing how this connected, and that was chapter 2, when we saw that chapter 2, verse 1, was 2001. And then we started looking at the book of Judges quite a bit differently. We could see that all of these uh, judges represent messages, and that the enemies are representing false messages. And so we can see here, when we get to Judges chapter 12, and the thing that's interesting is how what's happening in the movement is being paralleled with what we're studying. Not just, you know, something in the past, but even in the present. So I think it's, you know, it's definitely God's leading. It's not like we're, we're smart people or anything and we're, we can study the Bible or we have a better method of study in the sense that intellectually we do. We have to believe that God's leading us, or else we would never have seen any of this. It's intriguing because <clears throat> I've had multiple conversations with old friends of many issues within the books of Judges, within the different chapters. And a lot of their biggest issues have always come with the last four chapters. In a similar manner, I've had these, these kind of conversations with some that have had issues with the book of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of light that's been being opened over the last couple of years on these books that have raised questions but the questions have never really been answered agreed judges too looking at this as a progression of years within the movement has given us a a foundation to be able to take the rest of this book chapter by chapter and look at the messages contained therein Mm -hmm. and, and of course, God's word is far beyond our understanding in that there's so many different, I mean, obviously, if this history hadn't had to happen that we've just passed through, we couldn't look at judges and see what we see, right? I mean, not right. Really, never happened or so. But God's word has contained in it all of these levels of understanding. I remember when I first became an Adventist, I read uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. Um, uh, the, the introduction to it. Um, the one thing that they talked about was understanding God's word, how we understand it. And they dismissed um, 
what they called the hidden understanding. That is, the Jews understood that the Bible had in it all kinds of symbols that, that gave light to what was seen on the surface. That is, the Bible was deep. And so the way that we're studying is a way that has actually been rejected by the church. Now, it is true that none of this hidden study can ever contradict the plain teachings of Scripture. Right? So that was the problem with the Jews, is they could have this hidden understanding that was a rejection of the surface understanding. And this is what Parminder has been teaching, right? We have plain statements in the spirit of prophecy about the Sabbath, but his method of study can get him to say that the Sabbath keeping by Adventists was a mistake. Right. And, and that you can't do. What, what, what the scriptures do when you look at it in the detailed way that we do, and you look at these connections from other scriptures, is you see that the Bible comes alive. What's on the surface now becomes more understandable. And actually, this is exactly how the New Testament writers understood the scriptures. When Paul goes through Hebrews chapter 1 and quotes all these Old Testament passages that aren't talking about the Messiah on the surface, he understands that they are, in reality, talking about the Messiah, talking about Christ. And, and he's using a type of proof, te proof text method, which the church has rejected. You know, when, when Paul says that Psalm 40, that's in Hebrews chapter 10, he talks about Psalms 40, and he applies it to Christ, that would go against the modern method of Bible study. Or when you take Isaiah uh, chapter 7, and it talks about a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you apply it to Christ, the modern method of Bible study should reject that if it's consistent. It often just accepts the New Testament writer's testimony. But in, in actuality, it's not talking about Christ at all. It's talking about Manasseh the son that's going to be born to the virgin. And the virgin is, of course, not a woman. Literally, it's, it's a woman. But symbolically, it's Judah. It's, it's Israel that gives birth to Manasseh. So, you know, all through how we have studied is, is something that is consistent with the plain teachings of Scripture. It's consistent with what was given in the past. But it is something that, in order to understand it, you have to pass through history. You have to be part of prophecy to see it. So here, just looking at Judges 12, verse 6, the way that we have come in this movement to be able to look at a verse like that and to see the 2520 and look at the 42,000 and see the 2520 and look at the word shibboleth and sibboleth and see the symbol for the day for year principle being expressed there and seeing how it's connected to our movement. All of that is because God has been leading us and teaching us. And the question is, are we going to continue allowing God to lead and teach us? Or are we going to go back to the church? And this movement has tended to go back to the church. Most people who leave this movement, where do they go? into the corporate church we go into the corporate church and the question is why because their sentiments their belief system aligns with the teachings of the corporate church even though they've been in this movement for a time even parminder's group it's just it's in line with the corporate church is it not pretty much on the liberal side of things but it's still in line with the corporate church I mean, one of the things, the first things they did after they uh, had that, we had that split in 2019, is they started using the conference Sabbath school quarterly.
Wow. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that they'd gone that far. Yeah. They put up the videos for a bit, and then they stopped doing that. Isn't that kind of like a dog returning to its own vomit? Mm -hmm. And all of us are like that. Whatever principles are actuating us, we're going to end up following those principles. So we need to be born again. We need this new principle in our heart on how we look at things, how we look at God, how we look at ourselves. And it's only through a study of the God wor God's word with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we can be changed. Okay. So, in Judges 12, 7, and Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Would this represent the beginning from the end? He worked six years and rested in the seventh? Mm hmm I was going to ask if this isn't a representative a representation of a jubilee. Um, well, I, I would think I'd agree more with Rosanna in that it's the sabbatical rest. Okay. Six years, six days you labor and you rest the seventh, six years and you have the land rest on the seventh. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know about the jubilee here. But I definitely can see the sabbatical cycle, whether it's in days or years, it's the same pattern. Okay. But the fact that we have here the Jubilee sabbatical cycle, if you want to put it that way, with Judges 12.7, because we know 12.7, um, the significant significance of 12.7, of course, it's on the 1843 chart. Um but we also have this idea of um, with the 12-7, we have a number of things. We have a July 21, if we do it in reverse, right? Midnight. Okay. Um, um, what was the other one? Um, yes. So you have the 12 sons of, of Jacob right connected with the seven years i mean it's as a symbol right he has seven sons there's seven years that he works for leah and then for rachel and there's also the seven years of joseph and um after they enter into um uh, egypt there's going to be five years left for the famine and then 12 years left after that so you have another symbol of 12. There's a whole bunch of things we did with this. I can't remember everything. But when we see 12-7, um, it, it relates to um, um, trying to think. Oh, it's uh, Daniel 12-7, right? So Daniel 12-7. All right. I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And this is the first 1260, not the second 1260. Um, though some people try to say both 1260s are represented here because of the left and right hand, um, and that could be could be the case as well. But on the surface, it's talking about the first period of 1260 years. Um, so Daniel 12, seven has this, um, and was it Rachel or Sarah who died at? Sarah. Sarah died at 127 years, okay. So, um, so you have all of these different 
And of course, we've already looked at these hands dealing with the shin symbol um, and Daniel 12 and Revelation 10. So we just keep coming around again and again to these symbols that point to the symbolic understanding that has come in this movement regarding prophecy and regarding numbers and symbols. All of these things are tied to this message. So Judges 12.7 is going to be the end of this um, section, and, and it's pretty fitting that it is. It's our end, too. Yeah. It's the beginning and the end. Yeah, and then it says Jephthah judged Israel six years, right? And so it's in verse 7 that he's going to die, and that's going to be the seventh year, right? So again, you have that symbol of of the seven, right, as we, we noted. Yeah, the the point from the chat, we don't know how old Raquel was when she died. As yeah. we look at this situation, Sarah is the only woman in the Bible whose age, her death, and her burial are distinctly noted. Well, yeah, because even with um, Miriam, we don't know how much older she was than Aaron and Moses, right? Correct. We know when she died, but we don't know how old she was. I don't think right. it gives her age. So, I mean, we can we can make assumptions, but we have no definite yeah age given within Scripture. Mm -hmm. So. I would think that, you know, the symbol here of 127, the end of Sarah, the death of Sarah being applied here would or could be another symbol of the death or the, the ending of FFA. But it's also from this ending, we have a new beginning. Mm -hmm. So. So now. Judges 12.8. And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. Now, the translators are believing that this was only a civil judge to do justice in northern, northeastern Israel. And if you're dealing with northeastern Israel, are you not dealing with that which is on the other side of the Jordan? Okay. Well, you're dealing with Gilead. Okay, but this Ibzen comes from Bethlehem. Yeah. So he's Ibzen of Bethlehem, and and he's going to be buried in Bethlehem when he dies. Yeah, see, that, that was the other thing with um, Jephthah. When he dies, he's buried in one of the cities of Gilead. They don't tell us where. Yeah, I know. I don't know why they don't tell us, but... So... So Ibzen, or Splendid, of Bethlehem, and since we're dealing with Bethlehem, the house of bread. Mm -hmm. Now what we are told about Ibzen is that he had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he sent abroad. And he took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons, and he judged Israel seven years. Now, Bethlehem is in which tribe? I mean, we know it ends up becoming Bethlehem, Judah. Well, isn't Bethlehem originally in... Um... Yeah. 
camp. I thought it was in. Uh, um, Our left handed tribe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Um, Joseph's brother, Joseph's full brother. Oh, so you're talking about um, Benjamin. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. So, um, yeah, because something happened there. Because um, the borders changed, right? I, I'd right. have to find where. Bethlehem is first mentioned. Now, it means son of the right hand, but they were left-handed. Right. Um, so that's in the book of Joshua, chapter 19. Uh, now, it looks like Zebulun. Uh, let me see here. I'm just going to read. Um because this is in the inheritance for Zebulun, and it looks like they're the ones who get um, Bethlehem. Was there more than one Bethlehem? Not that I know of. But yeah, I thought it was Benjamin, but because hmm. yeah, Benjamin doesn't get Bethlehem, but I, I can't remember all the borders and how they worked, but. Yeah, they're not as straightforward as some of the maps show. <clears throat> See, the thing is, Bethlehem is south of of Jerusalem, and Zebulun is way up north. Right. So how do they get Bethlehem? Unless, That's an interesting I mean, question. I mean, unless there is another Bethlehem. Because I know that they, they claim Bethlehem Ephrata. Yeah. So, okay, there is a Bethlehem of Galilee. Okay. So, I guess that's what's being referred to there. So, Because that would be the north. Okay, so this obviously, um, I mean, I would assume, I shouldn't say obviously, but the, I would assume this would be the Bethlehem that's near Judah. That's in Judah, but. Okay. But why, why is it so important that we note that he had 30 sons and 30 daughters? And that he sent his daughters abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. I mean, 30 is one tenth of 300. We get that. Well, the other thing is we had already noticed the two 30s when it came to the two months. Right. So we had applied the 30 years that start on. November 9th, 1989, going to November 9th, 2019, and another period of 30 years that starts on December 25th, 1991, going to December 25th, 2021. And so 30 sons and 30 daughters could represent these two over overlapping period of 30 years. 
But then we have a third group of 30 that's also introduced in this verse. Right. So this is something that's being attached to this other 30. So it's something that's brought in. And then he's going to judge Israel seven years, right? So again, you have the seven years of the 2520. Okay. Now, I had marked seven years from uh, December 25th, 2012 okay. to no November 15th, 2019. That is, um, it's seven times 360. It's 25, 20 days from December 21st, 2012 to November 15th, 2019. And so when I was at the School of the Prophets back on November 9th, 2019, um, Jeff was talking about this extra week of probation. Okay. And if you count from the 9th to the 15th, inclusively, it's seven days. So Jeff had, had marked this period. Um, without knowing about the 2520 from December 21st, 2012 to November 15th, 2019. That is, there was a call being made out to those who had followed Parminder and Tess in the presentations that were done in that week, even though technically their probation had closed with uh, November 9th having come and gone. Would that have been similar to the point that the leadership of the Church of Christ time closed their probation, but a, a call was made to the individual members after that point yeah uh, i mean i can't remember all of jeff's reasoning of why why he was doing it like what his main main argument was but it's definitely he was giving a period of time a week um from november 9th okay so i just thought it was interesting that you know that week ended you know 25 20 days from december 12 2021 and of course, December 12, 2021 is exactly midway between June 22, 2014 and June 22, 2017. Uh, these two, or pardon me, June 22, 2011 and June 22, 2014. There's another one. Um, that that was between those two dates where he got the $165,000. And then when they had the first camp meeting in 2014 in Arkansas. So right in the center of that is the start of this 2520. So, I mean, that's where I would place it. So if we're going to say that he judged Israel seven years, um, this would represent at least um, something connected with, I would think, the first 30 Right, because that's going to be from November 9th, 2000, or 1989 to, to November 9th, 2019, plus this extra week. Okay. And, and the, the years can also represent that week. So it's interesting that you have the 2520, which is seven years, plus a week, which is a symbol of seven. But we have 30 sons and 30 daughters, and then you're saying 30 um, sons-in-law that, that are, are as another period of 30. Well, okay, but he does not, it is not said to have 30 sons-in-law. They have, that he had 30 sons. And daughters-in-law, daughters-in-law, I mean, yeah, 30 yeah. daughters. I said it backwards. Yes. Yeah, 30 daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law. Right. Now, women represent churches, 
Right. Um, so the 30 suns are still there. And so the 30 suns would represent um, that first 30. But you have 30 daughters and 30 daughter-in-laws. But he sends his daughters abroad. And he took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. So his daughters-in-law are all from abroad. Right. So he's ex doing this exchange, right? Right. So he's sending out his 30 daughters, and he's taking in 30 other daughters to replace them. So and why so is he sending away his 30 daughters? Instead of marrying them locally. Right. Hmm. Because when you send someone abroad, you're sending them away. Yeah. Now, the admonition that had been given, of course, was not to let the sons marry of the nations around them. Mm -hmm. So he brings other women from abroad to marry to his sons. I mean, this, I mean, this is representing this movement in some way. Okay. You know that there is, like, sending your daughters abroad, that would be a bad thing to get married, right? Okay. Agreed. Um, because that would be, in a sense, marrying with the heathen nations around. But also taking in 30 daughters from abroad would also be a bad thing in that, they're going to influence the movement for bad. So this must represent something about the history of this movement from 1989 all the way up to 2021 in a, an exchange that occurs. you know, theologically or spiritually. Okay. Can, can we make a direct application? I'm trying to think of how. Well, I mean, we obviously aren't dealing with, um, I mean, could we, could daughters be ministries or movements symbolically too? That'd be an interesting symbol. Not that there's literally 30, 30 different ministries, but you have these daughters that exist, all of the people who are, uh, descendant of this message of Ibsen, which is FFA. Okay. Right. So okay. some of those go abroad and we also bring some in. Um, All right. That's a negative thing in both cases. But in a situation mathematically, if you have two negatives, does that not also increase? Um, what do you mean? If you were to take, you've got 30 daughters that you send away, you have 30 daughters that you bring from an outlying area. You still have 30 daughters, but now you also have 30 daughters in law. Yeah. So you got more, you're saying. Correct. Um, so they don't cancel each other out. Right. Okay. It's kind of like Keynesian uh, economics. 
I didn't think I was going to go that far left. <laughs> but anyway, not everybody knows what we're talking about. Just has to do with how uh, when you uh, a bank um, lends money. It, it ends up increasing its value because it has the money that's owed to it. Um, I can't remember exactly how it works, but uh, so they have the equity and then the money they're going to get paid back. It's so it's kind of how governments work. But anyway, okay, um, very, very quickly returning to another point. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at a different map right now. Okay. It shows a, a Bethlehem within the borders of Asher. Okay. And that's by, by Jerusalem? No, the Asher would be on the um, northwest coast. And where is that Bethlehem? Excuse me? Where where is that? Is it is it right is the Bethlehem where is it? Is it in the south or no? We're talking northwest, so we're we're more up near that area that was granted to Zebulun, and okay. not far outside of what was granted to Naphtali. Okay, so maybe originally Zebulun had that Bethlehem. That's possible. Okay, because so it also shows the Bethlehem that is south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. The Bethlehem Ephrata, Ephrata. Yeah. So. So there, there's likely more than one Bethlehem. Okay. So. Okay. Just a thought. Okay. So, then died Ibsen and was buried at Bethlehem. But we're assuming this is the Bethlehem in the south. Well, we, we can make the assumption there. We could, I mean, we just stated that there was more than one Bethlehem and it's not being clear as to which Bethlehem we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, and after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel and he judged Israel 10 years. Why is that important? Why why his judgment of 10 years? Cuz Elon in this would mean oak grove. Yeah. Well, what you're going to see in this uh, this section is you're going to see Seven years, ten years, and eight years. Wouldn't that be July 18th? Seven years, ten years, and eight years. Where are we getting eight years? Uh, that's going to be the last one. Okay. That's so, yes, yes, you would have July 18th with that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and these are all sort of minor judges in that they there's nothing really particularly uh, they're not really mentioned anywhere else in detail. We don't know much about what happened about enemies or anything. We just know that uh, they were judges and they have these strange numerical uh, details attached to them. And with Elon, it's, it, I mean, he's going to have, um, <coughs> uh, you know, he's going to have 40 sons and 30 nephews, and they're going to ride 70 asses. And he's going to judge Israel eight years. So, uh, no, that's the, that's not, that's Abdon, pardon me. Right. So with Elon, it doesn't really say much, just that he reigned 10 years and he was buried in Agilon in the country of Zebulun. There's a judgment of six years in 12-7. Um, right, we were addressing that earlier. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we got six years. But in this section, these are all minor judges. I mean, there's there's not much detail. And even Elon is, is the least amount other than the 10 years. He doesn't have any numbers attached to him. He's it, buried in Agilent, which is the deer field. It, it's kind of interesting because we have Ibzan being said of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. We then have Elon, who is of the tribe of Zebulun. And it could be the Bethlehem in Zebulun that he was from, which would make sense based upon Elon being a Zebulonite. Okay, but then at the, the end, we have here Abdon, mm -hmm. but Abdon would very likely have been of the tribe of Ephraim. Yeah. Well, a Pirithonite, um, I mean, where is, what's a Pirith, Pirith, okay. Pirith, when there, there are only five verses that have to do with Pirithon within the Bible. Yeah. We're looking at Judges 12, 13, which is the first verse. And then 12, 15. And then 12, 15. Then we come to 2 Samuel 23, 30, about Beniah the Pirithonite. And then 1 Chronicles eleven thirty one, where we address Beniah the Pirithonite, but the fifth verse, 1 Chronicles 27, 14, reads the 11th captain, for the 11th month was Benaniah the Pirithonite of the children of Ephraim. And in his course were 20 and 4,000. Yeah, so these are our military divisions in First Chronicles chapter 27. Right. Um, and all I'm getting at is that Pirithon is identified as being within the tribe of Ephraim. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's all we know. I don't know where it is. Because Abdon in this situation is servitude. It's just, just interesting that it's the 11th captain for the 11th month. I mean, it's, it's obviously... The 11th month is going to have the 11th captain because each one is counting out the months. Right. We have 11 doubled, and, and 11 becomes a, a symbol, uh, Daniel 11, 11. And, um, uh, and that's going to be uh, Raphia, or, or Pinium, pardon me, right? Right. So Pinium. The king of the south shall be moved with collar, shall come forth and fight with him. So that's the battle of Raphia. Okay. So that's about in, in, in going through these three, as we're as we're looking at this, minor judges. So after Jephthah, we have Ibzan of Bethlehem that has judged Israel. And Ibzan had 30 sons and 30 daughters. The 30 daughters he sent abroad, and he took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, after Ibzan, we have Elon a Zebulonite that judges Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. And Elon the Zebulonite was buried in Agilon, or Agilon, in the country of Zebulon. So in this verse, Judges 12.12, 12, we also have another doubling. Mm -hmm. So Elon of the oak grove is buried in Ajalon, 
which is a deer field. Yeah. What is important about that? What symbol can we draw from that? I mean, the oak is seen as being, you know, a fairly stout tree. But why would why would this be a situation where the stout tree was then buried within a deer field? And he is the one that is judging Israel for 10 years. 10, is that not a symbol of judgment? Or a test. Or a test, right. Well, I mean, we could apply this to the July 18, 2020 prediction dealing with Nashville. Um, well, I think we would have to. Yeah. I don't see a way that we cannot. Okay. So now, and Elon the Zebulonite died, was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulon. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirithonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews, or 40 sons and 30 sons' sons that rode on three score and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. Now, 70 is a symbol. Yeah. Just going back to Zebulun, remember that uh, Odilio had showed that from the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, May 23rd, 1863, it was 57,400 days, which is the number of the tribe of Zebulun. Right. And that goes to July 18, 2020. Okay. All right. So Zebulun connects us to July 18. Okay. Now, we are coming close to the end of our time together. Hmm. Okay. Uh, comment from the chat, uh, making use of Psalms 42.1 regarding the deer or the heart, water brooks, meaning God's word or present truth. So applying that where Elon was buried in Agilon could mean the oak, the solid tree resting within God's word. But we still have a few things to cover here before we go on to chapter 13. Mm -hmm. So are there any other comments or questions with what we've covered today? Uh, just one other comment about the 1111 okay. that we had there. Um, so we know that there's 11 generations to the flood. 11 generations from the flood to the entering to Jacob being the generation that enters into Egypt. We also have the 22 years in the story of Joseph that is divided as 11 and 11. And there's lots of other doublings of 11 that I, I just can't think of at the moment. But it does, but it does represent a mirror and, um, uh, so it represents midnight as well. And 
um, if we're going to take this uh, symbol of 1111 being raphia, raphia is also midnight because it's the center of the chiasm in Samuel Snow's um, history because he pro proclaims at Boston on July 21st, which is midnight. So just, just things dealing with how this is connected to our movement and its symbols. Okay. Anything else? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for this conversation, for this study. Direct us now today, help us as we go forward to consider that which we are learning to prepare to make use of that which we are learning and direct us so that those with whom we come in contact may see your character and not ours. Be with us now, direct us please in all things that you would have us to do today. Bless each one that have attended this meeting and those that will view it later on the internet. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.